Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the ThinkTech Broadcast Network. My name is Jonathan Helton, and I'm a policy researcher at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. And today I'm going to be filling in for our regular host, which is um, Grassroot Institute President and CEO, Dr. Kali'i Akina. So today we're going to be talking about solutions, solutions to Hawaii's housing crisis. And normally, when we think about housing policy, we think about state and local laws and regulations. But that doesn't mean that the federal government doesn't have a role to play in making how in fixing the housing crisis. And in fact, Hawaii's very own U.S. Senator Brian Schatz recently introduced a bill in Congress that could help increase the housing supply at the state and local levels, and especially near transit projects like Honolulu's Skyline. So here to discuss with me discuss this topic with me today is Andrew Justice. Andrew is a housing policy analyst at the Niskanen Center based in Washington, D.C. He's also a licensed attorney and holds a master's degree in urban and regional planning from the University of Michigan. Good afternoon, Andrew, and thank you for joining me on the show. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks for inviting me on the show. Of course. So just before we get into specifics, um, would you introduce yourselves to, be, to viewers a little bit about how you came to work on housing policy? Of course. My name is Andrew Justice, and like you said, I'm a housing policy analyst at the Niskanen Center. Uh, along with my colleague, Alex Armlovich, uh, we launched the Niskanen housing policy effort in May of 2022. Uh, our focus is generally on growing housing supply nationally and recognizing that most of what limits American housing supply are not technical barriers, but regulatory and procedural hurdles around things like land use rules, building codes, and other areas. That's exactly what we've been looking at at the Grasser Institute as well trying to streamline state um, and local approvals for housing projects to hopefully bring down the cost. So just before we get into the meat of the discussion, just a, a quick question about the Niskanen Center. So how was the organization founded? What, what is the mission of the organization? So the Niskanen Center is a nonpartisan think tank that tries to blend the best ideas from, or the best ideas as we see them, from the left and the right into solutions for America's more vexing challenges. We call this approach transpartisan rather than bipartisan because we don't merely seek to calculate the average between uh, both sides' positions on an issue. We try to come up with the best solution without being overly tied uh, to either the red team or the blue team. Yes, and I certainly appreciate this approach. At the Grasser Institute, we are also nonpartisan and, and try to work with both sides of the aisle. Um, whatever the issue is, we try to find the best solution. So let's talk a little bit about housing. So, as you know, Senator Brian Schatz recently joined a bipartisan group of lawmakers from the House and the Senate and proposed the Build More Housing Near Transit Act. So you've looked into this. Can you tell the viewers a little bit about what the legislation is trying to achieve? Sure. Uh, the Build More Housing Near Transit Act is an elegant solution to this phenomenon of transit projects that are built away from where most people live or they end up where stations get built. Uh, in lower density neighborhoods, uh, and the land, and then once the stations are built, land use rules don't change to let people uh, and businesses locate themselves near uh, the new transit system or or expansion. Uh, this trend isn't good, or we don't think it's good for the tran for the taxpayer who pays to build transit infrastructure through state, local, and federal taxes, uh, because it it's not allowed to be as useful as it could be. Uh, it's not good for the prospective rider who can't get where they want to go. And it's not good for the environment because even though we spend more to build more transit, people still end up driving. Uh, but back to the bill, uh, the latest version, as you might have seen, is uh, a bit different than last term's version of the bill. Uh, but the latest version modifies grant scoring for new transit proposals or expansion of existing uh, systems to favor those. Uh, with land use rules and permitting procedures near stations uh, that will allow the new transit and infrastructure to be more useful. These are basic and, and we think non-controversial things such as not requiring a bunch of surface parking near homes and businesses, uh, not having big minimum lot sizes for, for homes near transit stations uh, and allowing multifamily housing by right without needing discretionary approval from politicians or bureaucrats uh, that almost always add cost and delay to construction. Um, 
in the end, I think this policy will help fix some of our recent, you know, in the last decade or so, transit building issues that encourage bad projects and instead have and instead have planners prioritize uh, ridership, taxpayers, and the environment when they think about how to build and expand transit infrastructure uh, that maximizes its usefulness to people. Of course. And so that, that's what I was actually going to just ask you is, I know there had been a previous version and, you know, what were, what were the changes? So it, it is my impression that the previous version of the bill um, did not focus so much on here's a list of policies that we would like to see um, city, cities and states take um, in order to be, um, in order to fulfill the strings attached to this grant. It focused more on we would like to see some plans to pass policies. Is is that a fair categorization? Right. It had um, a couple of elements. One was plans to pass policies. The other one was establishing uh, like a local funding stream for TOD. And then there was a third kind of catch-all for um, anything that the Secretary of Transportation um, identified. The new bill also requires the uh, DOT Secretary and the HUD Secretary to come together and kind of break down silos between the two agencies uh, when it comes to deciding what policies help um, build more housing near transit, to, to quote the bill title. Um, and that's kind of a core issue with uh, public transit in the United States really since the founding of the DOT and the moving of the federal mass transit program from HUD to DOT um, is that it's siloed away from the people with expertise on, on home building. Yes, and so I mean, you've broken the people who fund the transit project from people who might be considered about, you know, what what types of housing should be built around it. I, I do understand how the miscommunication would result in what, what Hawaii has today with the skyline. The skyline was built, started on the west side of Oahu and is being built toward downtown Honolulu. But on the on the west side, it's it's a lot of low density housing, and it you know people do live there, but nowhere near as many people um, or businesses as downtown. So we, I mean, we're certainly experiencing what happens when you build it and then you don't zone the land mm -hmm. so that people can build dense housing around it. And as a result, there's ridership has been low and there hasn't been as much housing um, per, being produced around the skyline. Um, but, I, but I do wanna talk about the new starts program. Um, that's the program that is a part of the bill and it says, you know, if a state or a locality wants to receive transit money under this new starts program, they have to take these um, deregulatory actions um, regarding zoning. So Honolulu's um, Skyline did receive funding under this program. Uh, they haven't received all of the funding that they were kind of allotted. Is there any chance that this bill is retroactive so that Hawaii would have to um, pass some of these zoning reforms to get the rest of that money? Uh, you know, I'm not really sure, uh, and I, I don't think I could you know, speculate on that. Yeah, no, that's 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 fair. It would be, it would probably be good to to encourage the state and um, the city council here to try to invest in greater TOD zoning and density, um, maybe to get part of that money that they're still looking for on the rail. But um, let let's move on. So there was this isn't the only federal bill or federal program related to increasing housing supply at the mm -hmm. state and city level. So I wanna talk about the grant program that Senator Schatz um, helped get into law um, this past year. And it, the, the uh, technical name is the Pathways to Removing Obstacles to Housing Program. It's administered by HUD. So um, can you tell me about some of the background of this and maybe what it's hoping to achieve? Actually, if there's if we could go back to uh, the Honolulu skyline just for a moment. Yeah, yeah, let's go back to that. Yeah. I think like one thing, if Senator Schatz's bill was law when this project was being planned, maybe you know, 20 years ago, you would probably see the, the the proponents of the of the system build it in kind of the opposite order that that it's currently being built, where phase three would probably have scored better relative to you know, phase one and two. And so they would have probably tried to start with that. Um, and then phase one would have been probably less competitive, especially if you look at systems that were built around the, or started around the same time, um, like Denver or Charlotte, where their light rail systems go 
you know, right through the center of their downtown and are quite, quite useful. But that's not to say that vision one or not vision one, phase one uh, of Skyline uh, has to be a white elephant, um, you know, in perpetuity. If you look at photos of um, the elevated subway uh, in New York City and Queens from like 1915 when, or 1916 when it was first being built, you'll see a heavy rail subway system being built out into what looks for all purposes a rural area. Um, but we all know that they, the city, you know, let people build lots of homes and businesses uh, very quickly in that area, which made uh, that new transit system very, very useful, very fast. And like you were talking about a few moments ago, um, Honolulu can still let people build homes near that um, transit system and solve two problems um, more or less at once in boosting housing supply for the region, but also uh, allowing more people to ride the system. Yeah, so so in other words, if this um, if this Build More Housing Your Transit Act had been law back in 2005, 2006, then Honolulu might have realized that the incentive was to start downtown and build west as opposed to starting on in the west side, building east. So, I mean, that, that, would, that probably would have increased ridership. I know the ridership numbers, they were hoping for maybe 10,000 people a day by the end of the year. Right now it's looking like maybe 3,500 a day on average. It, is, it has not been what they've hoped for. And so part of it is because not a lot of people live where the rail's at and where the rail ends. I mean, it's, it's an abandoned stadium. It's not, mm. it's not the most ideal ending. So um, if, if you're good, we can let's go on to the YIMBY grant, I guess, as, as people have called it before. Yeah, um, but, it, it's had some some colloquial names, but yes. Yes. So um, what does it work and what's its goal? So HUD's, uh, as we've called it, the the YIMBY grant uh, program, although it's officially called the Community Development Block Grant Pro Housing uh, Grants. Excellent, uh, excellent naming. But um, it will reimburse communities on a competitive grant basis um, that are modifying local regulations and procedures to allow um, more housing production generally. Um, the program is more of a pilot program in its scale. Uh, the total budget for the whole country is $85 million. And um, as you can imagine, that would be spreading it quite thin. Um, yeah. So the amount won't reimburse every community that wants to rewrite their zoning code or encourage exclusionary places to uh, you know, change their ways all at once. Uh, but the good news is the applications that do get funded in this fiscal year should be impactful and get homes built where they're badly needed. So directionally, it's probably a good thing. And if it goes well, uh, you know, we might see it get repeated. Yes. So I, I know there's been, there's been some criticism that this was more aimed at um, helping fund plans than helping fund direct policy change. But with, um, I think they've already started accepting applications. Do you know if the applications that we've seen so far have um, been for, hey, here's concrete policy change to reduce parking minimums, reduce minimum lot sizes, things like that? I think it's been a pretty mixed bag. And I saw recently that the, the deadline for applications was extended. Um, but because there's so little money to go around, I'm pretty confident that the the proposals that do get funded will be worthwhile and and have more concrete, you know, production based results rather than just mere planning. Okay, and so so I guess that's a PSA for any um, Hawaii state or local officials who are listening or watching that the, the, the deadline has been extended. So you know, it's it's possible that um, one of Hawaii's counties, if they haven't already applied, could apply and get some of this additional money. Um, but let's, um, before we move on to some of the other topics, are there any other federal bills that are being considered or um, existing federal programs that create these um, sort of grant-like incentives for states and uh, cities to boost housing stock? Not, not um, grants per se. Um, you know, one thing we're looking at um, and working with uh, Senator Mike Lee's team on is uh, proposals to um, transfer some federal federally managed land under the Bureau of Land Management, particularly in Western states, uh, to communities that have a lot of housing pressure 
and um, and are abutting and kind of hemmed in by by federal land in their area. Uh, we think it's a pretty thoughtful bill in that they go to great lengths to to describe all the the types of federal land that are off limits, things like national parks, national monuments. Um, environmentally sensitive areas, of course, like DOD land uh, as well. But um, it was this working with them on this bill has been really illustrative, not just in in how thoughtful they are, but in just how much of the West, um, how much of the West is under federal ownership and how hemmed in a lot of these cities are. Um, so I'm hopeful that, you know, in the you know months and, and year ahead, we might be able to make some progress on that. Um, to help provide some relief for these cities uh, and in exchange have them um, you know commit to building building more housing in this uh, in this land I mean that sound that does sound like a as you said a thoughtful bill and, and of course we've worked with uh, Senator Lee in the past on on Jones Act and maritime related stuff which I know um, you're familiar with um, but I do I do want to talk about uh, pre-approved plans. So uh, you've written about this recently. So can you um, describe to someone who might not be familiar with how pre-approved plans work, um, just kind of how a city would go about creating one and what the advantages are? Sure. As you know, we're all kind of painfully aware of, uh, housing costs are influenced by a variety of factors. Uh, land, the cost of land itself and zoning regulations are among the biggest pieces of the overall pie. Uh, but things we'll call soft costs like building design, architectural um, design, uh, and uh, zoning approvals are an underappreciated source of costs and delays. Soft costs generally account for about 30% of project costs. And of course, they're going to be a higher share uh, for smaller or kind of one-off infill projects like you see in a lot of, a lot of cities. Um, some communities though, are taking what we think is an entrepreneurial approach. Uh, to reducing these costs within their jurisdiction by um, drafting on their own uh, what they're calling pre-approved and open source, so you don't they're not like copyrighted or anything, uh, building plans that property owners and developers can use for either minimal cost in a place like Milwaukee, I think they charge like fifty dollars uh, or no cost um, in a place like South Bend. Um, the developer can take these plans know in advance that they're going to be approved in certain um, residential districts and um, take them to a contractor and, and have them get built. Um, we would say this approach not only saves uh, on architectural and engineering costs just in the absolute, um, but the time savings gets homes uh, built and on the market faster than they would be otherwise with a kind of a, with one off, you know, bespoke design and approval process uh, for each project. So the way I see it, it seems like the pre-approved plans would make it a lot easier for people who didn't have, for people who are just maybe small scale developers, or maybe they have the money to put an ADU on their property. As a, like it, it would have a bigger benefit for those people maybe than some of the large development firms who have the, the time and money to, to sort of wait out the permitting process. It, it, you think that's accurate? Definitely. Um, and following that trend of anytime you've got small or singular developments, the, the soft costs are going to be a bigger share than, than if you're building, you know, a hundred unit apartment building all at once or something. Um, but I think we've seen in not only, you know, South Bend, Milwaukee, uh, different cities like, what is it? Los Angeles and Seattle, I think have ADU oriented um, pre-approved plans specifically um, for ADUs rather than like, primary residences like in South Bend. In um, South Bend, which we wrote about recently, um, their, their pre-approved infill program is um, about one year old, probably one in a few months, year old now. Um, but at the time of, um, of writing, I think they had maybe one, one home under construction and then like 10 more in the pipeline. And then you know, since then, within the last, I think week or so, a nonprofit developer, from uh, I think Evansville, Indiana, committed to building 50 homes using those plans uh, out of the city's catalog. And you can pretty plainly see it's a win-win because the city gets a, you know scores of homes built uh, on vacant land, but also that those homes are a known quality since they would have 
you know, design them themselves. Um, and they match their aesthetic preferences, which is, I, I guess, good. And uh, meanwhile, the nonprofit developer saves money that they would have otherwise spent on architect architectural and design services and can deploy the savings towards their core mission of building homes for people. Yes, no, for sure. And I, I just will add to that. I, I was looking earlier today, I found a report from 2016 um, from the Maui County Council, and they were discussing this topic. And at least, so in 2016, they predicted that pre-approved plans would have saved um, three to six months on uh, design and permitting. And I, you know, I don't think that that report um, precipitated, created any action, which, which is unfortunate. Um, and none of the other counties um, have any other pre-approved plans either. So it, it's definitely something to look at, considering that in Hawaii, if you want to get a, a building permit, in most counties, you may have to wait for five months to even get your building permit. Mm -hmm. And so compared to the mainland, Hawaii, permitting process is usually even slower. So I, I think the this proposal is probably something that would be very helpful to people. So I, I do want to move on to talk about manufactured homes just for a minute. Um, there's been a discussion about bringing manufactured homes to Maui to provide um, temporary shelter for people who've been displaced by the wildfires. Um, so you and I talked about this um, last week, and you talked about how there's different building codes and different building standards in place for different kinds of manufactured housing. So could 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 you um, could you break that out for viewers? Sure. So within uh, what we would call um, as like a genre, factory built or offsite home construction, as distinct from on-site home construction, which is you're literally building the house in the place where it's going to be uh, used. But so offsite or factory built includes three main types. One is HUD code manufactured homes. Colloquially, these are referred to as mobile homes, but they all will adhere to the national HUD code, meaning they're built to this code. They can be put in any of the 50 states with you know kind of minimal changes. Um, and then from there, You've got modular homes. Those are going to be built either as you know wall modules, a series of wall modules, or room-based modules, and then assembled um, on site, kind of Lego style. Uh, and then the third third version is panelized construction, where it's just the walls are pre-made in a factory, and then they're all shipped in to the site and assembled on site. The distinction between modular panel and panelized from HUD code is modular and panelized have to adhere to the whatever the local building code is. And so you lose some of the efficiency that comes with a national you know, HUD code, uh, but you do get a little more customization for, for local conditions. So for the HUD code specifically, is that does that just apply to what we would traditionally maybe call mobile homes? Uh, or is that, or is it, or is it broader than that? Well, HUD code is a is like a defined term, and you know, mobile home is just kind of a, a slang for it. But um, if we're if we're going to get really really into the weeds, so you've got uh, like a factory that's making HUD code homes on the same production line, they could make what are called park models, which are uh, if you've ever seen like a tiny house, those are often non HUD code, but still a a, a semi-permanent home on a, a trailer right on a trailer chassis but um as far as like primary residence full-time any anything that we would identify as a mobile home is going to be a hud code home right yeah so that's that's what i was trying to get at is it whether or not there was any maybe any of the kind of penalized as you called them like, like lego style homes that might might fall under hud code um oh but, no they're those are going to be under the whatever the local code is. I gotcha. So, so then talking about building code, have you found any states or localities that have a building code that is particularly friendly to um, offsite built housing? Not that I'm aware of. Most of our most of our efforts are around um, you know trying trying to make HUD code homes. Um, able to compete on a fairer playing field with uh with site built site built construction 
historically, you know, groups like the National Association of Home Builders were opposed um, to normalization of competition between HUD code and site built homes. But um, today there are HUD code builders as members of the NAHB and um, they're generally seen as being being on side and, and recognizing that America has a, a shortage, particularly of starter homes for people. And that um, you know, as the Harvard Center, Joint Center for Housing Studies uh, has found recently that HUD code homes for the same spec are generally 25 to 70% less expensive to build than uh, the equivalent site built house. And at that end of the market, it's just the better tool for the, for the job. Yes. And I imagine with um, the dramatic increase in um, input, like like lumber prices recently, that I mean that that difference may have grown. I don't know when that study was was issued that you're referencing, but any yeah, any time that you know material prices are are higher, factory built homes, which not only HUD code but modular and panelized as well, are going to have an advantage just because because they're in a controlled environment, they're wasting less material. Yes. And historically, I, I think what you're saying holds true for Hawaii, where a, a lot of the opposition to any of these prefab homes um, comes from some from the home building associations and, and some of your contractors. So it was I mean, it, it made news headlines after the wildfires when I, I think that um, some of the governor's staff um, probably met with some of the contractors and and they agreed, hey, we're going to be trying to bring in a lot of prefabricated homes because we need housing and, and we need it fast. And mm -hmm. Maui was already in a housing shortage before the wildfire. It's it's much worse now. But I'll you know I'll I'll throw in um, one more nugget for viewers. In Hawaii, there's not a lot of there's not a ton of zoning barriers to prefabricated homes. Although um, according to the State Land Use Commission. If you want to build a home on agriculture land that is designated as agriculture land by the, the state LUC, you cannot put a mobile home there. So because um, so much of the land in Hawaii is designated as agriculture, that, that does limit the ability of someone to come in and say, hey, you know, I'd like to use this vacant land and maybe put in some sewer and electric hookups and maybe create a mobile home park. Um, uh, under land, land use commission rules, uh, that would be a no-go if that's ag land. So that's something that I know we've been in, discuss in discussion with lawmakers about why do we have this particular requirement when you can put a mobile home on other types of land. So, uh, Andrew, I think that we've pretty much run out of time. Um, so I'm just going to ask you anything else um, you'd like to add to wrap up this conversation. Yeah, I think just to close, I want to say that in the past, you know, when humans, you know, we didn't have elevators, we didn't have tall buildings or sanitary sewer systems, cars or electric trains, uh, building enough homes so people could leave, lead healthy and prosperous lives was a technical problem that was at that time beyond our collective ability to solve it. But today, we not only have all those inventions, but they're mature technologies that can be deployed almost anywhere and used to unlock more housing supply to meet demand. Rather than an unsolvable technical problem, today's housing shortage is an eminently solvable, mainly legal and regulatory problem, but we just have to let ourselves solve it. Yeah, well, I couldn't agree more. So I appreciate you joining me for this discussion today. Um, thank you to our viewers for watching. I hope that you found this informative, and I hope you'll join us again for the next episode of Hawaii Together. Aloha. Thanks, gentlemen.